clicked that button. And it looks like Instagram has said our connection is worthy. Facebook, YouTube, and Float are all giving me green check marks, which means it looks like we are live. Yay, we made it. So <clears throat> we will um, give everybody just a few minutes to uh, kind of get their notifications and hop on over if they are interested. We're already getting a couple jumping in on Instagram. Welcome, everybody. And um, so today is going to be a little bit of a different uh, format than I've done in the past. We've been getting a lot of questions and inquiries, especially with our puppies on ground. And so what we decided to do, um, or what I decided to do today, is to kind of go through some of the questions and the things that uh, we've been asked about and give kind of a, a multi-topic uh, talk today. And then uh, as we are going through this, if you guys are interested in asking questions and things like that, um, please put them in all caps. If you're on a cell phone, you can double tap your, uh, your little caps button and uh, it should put your caps lock on and then you can type your question in and that way they're easy for me to see. Um, it's throwing me off a little bit. I got a new monitor, and uh, so my uh, camera runs off my computer. I normally have the screen that is what is you guys are seeing down, uh, and it keeps drawing my attention up there on my high monitor, so I keep looking up at it, and uh, it looks a little funny to you guys. When I look at myself, I'm like looking up in the air. So I apologize if that's distracting for anybody else. Okay, so we've had a few minutes, so let's go ahead and uh, we'll jump into the recording, and then at the end, uh, we will go through any questions that you guys have along the way. There we go. All right, so here we go. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 103 of the Protection Dog Podcast, where we provide an alternative to conventional training methods and philosophy. I'm your host, Joel Riles, and today we are going to talk about several different topics. We're gonna to talk about puppies and puppy care and a little bit about our ENS process. We're gonna talk about pros and cons of kennels, fences, and runs. Uh, we're gonna talk about supplements. We get a lot of questions, especially around puppy time. Uh, people that are getting ready to get their puppies ask us about supplements a lot. And so I'm gonna uh, show you guys the two supplements that we use. We're gonna talk about developing confidence in young dogs. Uh, kind of the, uh, the training and, and some of the stuff we focus on um, in the first six to eight months of a dog's life. Uh, we have summer coming up here and it's getting ready to start getting hot, especially down here in Florida, uh, over in Texas and, and kind of in the southern parts of the U.S. And so we're going to talk about uh, some safety and some heat dangers for our dogs and things we can do about it. And, uh, and then uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about a format shift. I think I'm going to be doing uh, in the podcast, and it won't really affect most of you that much, but I think it'll open up a little bit to a broader audience, and I'll talk about kind of what I'm planning to do there and why, and then still interested in getting uh, you guys' feedback on that. Uh, but before we jump into those topics, let's talk about today's sponsor. Today's sponsor is Canine Academy Online. Canine Academy Online is making dog training easy. We have local and online dog training. We have a franchise in the Houston, Texas area. Uh, we have a franchise that I run here in the Orlando area of Florida. And uh, we have our online training. And my uh, franchisee over in Texas also offers Zoom training. Uh, so Zoom video calls. Uh, so you can live in Maine and do a Zoom video call with him and get your training that way. Uh, the topics we cover are obedience, service dog training, uh, tracking, protection, and tactical work. If you would like to find out more information uh, or need help training your dog, contact us at our website, canineacademyonline.com. That is the letter K, the number nine, academyonline.com. You can also email me at joel, J-O-E-L, at canineacademyonline.com. And you can check us out on Facebook and Instagram and YouTube by searching for Canine Academy. I also have uh, MeWe and Float that I kind of combine uh, my Fortress Canine and Canine Academy companies in uh, into their uh, feeds just because it's too hard to keep two or three feeds going in every single uh, platform that we're on. Um, so if you're following us over there, you can get a lot of uh, information or contact me uh, with any questions that you might have on MeWe and Float as well. 
And uh, you can find those by searching for Canine Academy, uh, Canine Academy Online, or Fortress Canine on those platforms, and you should be able to find us pretty easy. We have a picture of our dog uh, or of a dog uh, and or our logo on all of those platforms. All right. Um, also, a quick reminder, uh, we have a few puppies left on MDK Punisher litter. So we, she had uh, five puppies, her last litter. Um, it was going, um, you know, we expected her to have about five or six puppies this time. And all of a sudden, uh, lo and behold, 11 puppies. So uh, we do have some availability. Uh, we do not often get availability. Our electro litter has zero availability on it. It was a perfect size litter for us. So if you're interested in getting a um, Malinois, it's a MDK Punisher. You can find those both those parents on our Instagram story highlights at, at fortresscanine.puppies. And um, check them out. If you're interested in getting one of those, uh, you can contact me. Uh, you can just send me a DM straight through that Instagram page, and, uh, and we will get you guys set up. All right. So that takes care of our housekeeping. Let's go ahead and jump into the topic for today or I should say the topics. So first of all, puppy care and our ENS process. So a lot of people kind of wonder how we raise our puppies, how we do our whelping, all of that sort of thing. Um, we do not interfere with mama and puppies very much at all. Uh, we believe that mama knows better what's going on with her puppies than we do. Um, every once in a while, there may be a little something that we go, that's not a, a mama or puppy fault. Um, so we're going to interfere there a little bit. Um, for instance, uh, Karma, which you'll see on our Fortress Canine um, Instagram channel and, and some of our other stuff. She's a small little German Shepherd female. She uh, had her umbilical cord wrapped around her neck and her, her little paws were up inside her neck like this, which is probably the only reason she survived. And so she has these little scars across her paws here and here, if you're seeing on the video, and um, across her, her, her little uh, tops of her little paws. And because having an umbilical cord wrap around a puppy isn't the puppy's problem, it's not a genetic problem, um, we gave her a little extra care to get her caught up with her uh, litter mates. And, uh, and as soon as she caught up with them on size, we let her go with them. So um, we'll occasionally step in and things like that. But if mama feels like a puppy um, should not be around anymore, we almost never interfere with that. Now, some people don't like that, and I can appreciate it because I don't like it either. But we know that mama knows better. And every time we have interfered in the past, we've always regretted it. So we know if mama doesn't want to take care of one of her puppies, then there's something wrong with that puppy. Um, unless there's something wrong with the mother, but you know, all of our mothers are good. And, uh, and so we don't step in with that. Now, what we do with the pups is starting about two weeks old. Uh, so we kind of check on them every day and, uh, we put their little colored collars on. So we check to make sure, you know, as they're growing, they grow real fast as puppies. We make sure the collars aren't too tight and we adjust them if they need to be adjusted. And, uh, we make sure, you know, mama or the puppies aren't pulling each other's collars off. And so we'll go put them back on if we need to, uh, make sure that their area is clean and, and uh, it's being maintained by mama and there's, you know, we don't need to move everybody out and do a cleaning and then reset everything back up, those sorts of things. So we check on them every day. Um, we typically check in the morning and in the evening quickly on the dogs. And then, and other than that, we just leave them alone, right? Um, once they're about two weeks old, we start the ENS process. And you've probably seen this if, you, if you've gone over to our puppy page and you've been interested in getting puppies from us. Um, we talk about our basic puppies get their ENS training. That's early neurological stimulation. I think the army came up with it um, or the military, uh, but I'm not sure if it was come up with by like some college somewhere or something. And then the military just uh, tested it, but it uh, has been proven in the military and the military working dogs to drastically reduce a dog's um, sickness throughout its life and to drastically increase its ability to deal with stress and, and uh, to improve its stress inoculation of the dogs. And it's, it's actually pretty simple. There's a few extra things we do sometimes, but basically what we do is we do a tactical stimulation on the dogs every day. Um, so once they're two weeks old, we pick them up and on each of their paws, um, they said to use a Q-tip. I just use my fingers because I like being in contact with the dogs. And uh, so I just rub around on their paws, on on, uh, on the bottom side, on their pads. I kind of get in between their pads and play with them. And I move over and play with this foot, move over and play with this foot, move over and play with this foot. And we do that for about three to five seconds um, on each of the puppies. And then we do the, we hold them head up 
right? So a dog is normally, their body is horizontal to the ground is their standard way that they live their lives, right? So you take the puppy and you hold them so their head is up and their body is hanging down and you're holding them. So they're secure, but you hold them head up. You do that for three to five seconds. You turn them where they're upside down. Their head is down for three to five seconds. And then we kind of snuggle with them for a second. And then we'll hold them on their back for three to five seconds. So they're they're horizontal, but they're upside down that way, right? So they're facing up. Their belly is up. And, uh, and then we do what's called a thermal stimulation. And what that is, is you take a wet towel, right? So you take a towel, you get it wet, and you kind of squeeze it out, but where it's still damp, put it in a refrigerator, and we just pull it out every day, do the stuff, and then put it right back in the refrigerator. And um, so it's cold, but it's not like freezing cold, right? And you spread that out on the ground, and then you just put the puppies on it, and we kind of go, oh, you know, all the puppies go on it. And then by the time they're on it, we grab the first one that was on it, and we start taking them off, right? And that gives them about three to five seconds um, on the, the cold ground. And those five things done once a day from the time they're two weeks old makes a big difference in the dog's ability to handle things. So that's how the ENS process works. And then some of the other things we'll do is use uh, a couple of different feeding um, uh, trays. Like we have their metal bowls. We have a plastic bowl, a few different things like that. Um, we get them on a couple of different surfaces other than just the cold. So they'll be on the concrete and the rubber and they'll have uh, wooden surfaces and they'll have uh, cloth surfaces. And so it gets them used to kind of all those different things. The rubber is a little bit more slippery, especially when it's wet. The, uh, the concrete is kind of abrasive. The, uh, the fabric is soft and the wood has its own kind of texture to it, right? So we, we work through all of those things and, uh, and get them exposed to those different things. And then by the time uh, eight weeks comes around, the, uh, the people that are purchasing the basic puppies take their puppies home and the rest of the puppies start their, their other training, their obedience training and stuff like that. So um, if you guys have specific questions about puppies or things to do or not do, um, let me know in the comments. And as we go through, I will go through and work on uh, answering those things for you guys at the end. So the next question I got was um, pros and cons to kennels, fences, and runs. And, uh, and kind of what I recommend and what I use and what I don't use but wish I could use, that sort of thing. So first of all, the difference between a kennel and a crate. We, we do encourage crating your dogs. Uh, at nighttime, getting them used to being in the crate. So if you need them to be in a crate for a period of time, they can. Uh, it's very convenient for driving and traveling and things like that. But the, the crate is not a place that a dog really lives, right? Um, you may have them in there at work and at nighttime, but you want them out with you as much as possible other than that. A kennel is like a, a gate or a fence of some kind, um, typically like a 10 by 10, or maybe it's five feet wide and, and longer, uh, that sort of thing. And so um, we have a kennel here that has 13 kennel runs. And uh, and so the there's pros and cons to having the kennels, right? So the cons to the kennels are because there's concrete on the ground. Um, the dogs are on them all the time and their pads, instead of having a callus on their pads, which make them nice and tough, um, their pads are basically uh, more sensitive. Right. So they're OK on the concrete, but then you move them over to like rocks, like on the front of our kennel. We have rocks uh, so that we can park on them and stuff like that. And so as they walk across the rocks, you could tell they're a little more sensitive, uh, whereas when they have not been in kennel runs for a while, um, they get a nice callus on their feet and they can walk across the rocks like it's no big deal. Right. So that's one downside to the kennels. Another downside is when they go to the bathroom, they tend to step on it and spread it around. Um, so it's a little bit messy and it requires cleaning the kennels have to be cleaned multiple times a day, but also the dogs probably need to be washed, you know, once a week or something like that because they get stinky. And uh, and I don't like washing dogs that often because I don't think it's good for their coats to get washed that often. Um, now, if you have a yard and you're using fences, the pros and cons there are the pros are they're not on concrete, right? They're on uh, typically grass or dirt, uh, which is nicer for the dogs. But once a dog realizes that it can jump that fence and some dogs never do. But if a dog realizes it can jump that fence, an eight foot fence is not holding, uh, you know, a Malinois German Shepherd size dog in, right? Border collies, that sort of thing. They realize they can jump those fences. They're going over those fences and they're going to run around and have a good time. So that's the downside to fences. Now, what are a way that you can kind of take the fencing process and make it better? And that's with a run. Now, runs are uh, where you can either use chains or cables. 
some people use a, a cable attached to a cable. So what they'll do is they'll put a cable from like one tree to another tree, maybe uh, 20, 30 feet apart. And then you, you clip a second cable onto that so that they have a side to side space, but then they can run up and down the other cable. And the cable just slides and gets dragged across uh, the long cable, okay? Um, the, the benefit to that is it contains the dog, right? So that it's harder for them to, if they do get off it, they still have the fence there. So you still have a layer of security, but they can run and be more free. It works their legs. So one of the other downsides to a kennel run is like a horse in a stall, their front legs move more than their back legs, right? And so if a horse is in a stall too long, um, it will actually get lame in its back legs because the blood flow is dependent on the frog on the bottom of their hoof. And when they step on it, it actually pushes like a pump. It pushes blood the, as it comes down their legs, it pushes it back up into their body, right? And so kind of like when your legs go to sleep, if they don't move their back legs, um, they don't get that blood flow through them like they're supposed to, and it can be damaging to them. The dogs don't have that same exact problem, but you don't get the, the muscle development in the back legs the way that you like um, if they're in, a, in kennels too often. So if they're in a kennel, you either need to get them out or you need to work them or do things like that and just be really aware of watching the dog's uh, muscle development in its back legs uh, if they're in a kennel um, to make sure that they're getting the exercise that they need, especially in that first year when they're developing that, that muscle and all that kind of stuff. So when you're on a run, you get more movement, right? And so there's a lot more use of all four legs and they're getting all that exercise. They're still contained and there does seem to be something in the dog's minds about being um, essentially trapped in a cage versus connected to a, a, a cable or a chain on their collar and not seeing the barrier, right? They're held back because of the collar, but they're not, they don't see this thing that they can't go past right? So they don't feel as trapped. Now the dogs get used to, you know, all of the things and we don't keep any of our dogs in anything for too long, but there, to me, if I could put all the dogs on runs, that would be ideal, right? It's the, the thing about any of these things is you have to make sure that if you contain the dog in a space, you have to make sure that the dog has everything it needs in that space that you're containing it in. So you need to make sure um, it has um, a place to get warm in the wintertime if you're where it gets cold. So like a dog house with straw in it and things like that and fresh straw that you replace and, and pull out the old stuff as it needs. Um, in the summertime, they need to have shade. Uh, they need to have water accessible to them. And water is important whether it's cold or hot, right? So when it's hot, water is important to keep the dog's ability to cool itself. When it's cold, they still need water, but it freezes. <clears throat> so you got to keep in mind that you have to go out and, and um, bang out the ice out of their water containers, whatever that is, and replace it. Make sure that they have good water. And, um, and then uh, you have to make sure they, they don't overheat and they don't underheat, right? They don't get too cold and they don't get too hot. Um, so keeping their conditions fair to them, if you're going to contain them in a space, is really, really important. Now, you may only contain them in a space for an hour, but in Florida, in the summer, an hour is long enough for that dog to die, right? If there's not shade and they can't stay cool. Um, if you are in Alaska in the winter time, you have to make sure that your dogs are acclimated to the cold or they can't be out in minus 60 degree cold for very long at all, right? So you keep all of that in mind. This doesn't mean that the dogs are going to live in these spaces necessarily, even for short periods of time. If you have temperature extremes, you need to be very aware of that. And that extreme is relative to the dog's acclimation. So if the dog is always inside where it's nice and comfortable, even, you know, minus five degrees, maybe cold enough for that dog to go hypothermic. So just keep that in mind. Watch your dogs take care of them. Okay. So the other thing is, I'm going to try this for the first time, uh, supplements that we use and like. So I'm going to do my screen share. Let's see how this works. Um, oh, I want to do it this way. There we go. Look at that. Okay. Figuring out all my little buttons in StreamYard. Okay. So we use two supplements here um, at Fortress K9 with our dogs. And the young dogs, as they're developing, they kind of go through these periods where you, you like can't keep weight on them, right? So you're feeding them, they're eating, uh, but they're just, they're so active and they're in that, those like teenage stages, you know, where they're growing and they're developing so fast that it's hard to keep weight on them. So one of the things that we uh, have used and really like is uh, True Beast Muscle Builder and Performance. Now I just get this on Amazon. I have it come in once a month. 
Um, and this takes care of the dogs that need it for us. Uh, one of these a month, um, I get the big one, the 90 serving one. And, uh, and that takes care of the dogs each month. Now I will say, um, what I typically do is I order, like I get a bulk of them, I order three or four, and then I get them once a month after that. And so if we start to run low, then I just order you know two or three more and boost up our supply and then keep that monthly one coming in. So um, this is, now this is a muscle builder, right? So this is to put weight on the dog so that um, they, their muscles are developing and uh, and they're not getting getting skinny during those time frames. The other one that we use and really like is called uh, Canine Finest, uh, and it's made by Nature Rich. And so, and I'll, let me um, this this first one I'm going to go back to. This one I get on Amazon, and if you just put in True Beast Muscle Builder, um, it should pop up. Their website is xdog.com. So the letter X dog.com and um and it looks like they do have a subscription option themselves so um that's that's there they have a bunch of other things on their uh website so you're you're going with the supplements over there on them but we like them for uh, putting muscle and mass on the dogs when they need it um this one uh their website is canine the letter k the number nine just like i do canine finest.com and you can get this in everything from like an eight ounce, which is you know half a pound, uh, up to a pound or five pounds. For most people, if you got one pound uh, containers, it would probably last you about two months, um, the way we use it anyway. So we basically take one teaspoon, and um, and I scoop it and I kind of shake it where it's mostly level. And there's a little like a little scoop they provide. So for us, I use the big side, which which is probably a little over a teaspoon. But we scoop it in, we shake it a little bit. And then we put it on the food and mix it in, and uh, and we do the same thing with the um, the muscle builder. We it has its own little scoop in it, and you scoop, and you kind of shake it level, put it in there, and it's a real high fat um, supplement that that keeps the weight on the dogs a little better. And um, and so both of those are the ones we use. This one is primarily um, it uh, it helps with the gut of the dogs. So it's it's got some. Um, probiotics in it and stuff like that. They add vitamins, minerals, amino acids, uh, fatty acids. But the big thing is what we've noticed is they have better poops. They have less poops, which I know is not like exciting to talk about, but it's important when you're watching your dog, they start getting runny poos consistently and it doesn't get solid again. There's something going on in their gut and this um, really helps with that. Um, it also, they say, uh, helps during stress. Uh, since we've been using this with our uh, pregnant females, their um, puppies are way stronger and healthier and bigger when they're born, which mama might not like the size, but they, uh, it really, I think, helps uh, the mother through the, that process. And then um, they say it helps their immunity and their shiny coat and gives them more stamina. So our dogs have plenty of stamina. I have not noticed, a, per se, a difference there, um, but our dogs do look healthier and, uh, and they, they have much less gut issues here. Uh, when we're using that supplement. So those are the supplements we use and like. Um, you can give them a try if you're interested. Your mileage may vary a little bit, but we like and use both of those. So, okay, so the next question we had was how to develop confidence in your young dogs. So um, are you showing uh, pictures? You want me to show pictures of the puppies, baby? I can see what I can do there. Uh, near the end. I'll have to add that on, but I probably should show some of the pictures of the puppies. But if you haven't seen them already, go over to FortressK9.puppies on Instagram and uh, you can see lots of pictures there. And there's a few pictures of our pups in the other places. Okay. So developing confidence in young dogs. So one of the things that happens with the young dogs, and I'm, I'm talking everywhere from like eight weeks to kind of the eight month period. So everywhere in that category, uh, this is what we refer to as the dog's foundation. And uh, so the first 12 months overall are the dog's foundation and eight months and down, we kind of refer to as a puppy. They're still a little bit of a puppy uh, up to a year, sometimes a year and a half, people will consider them a puppy. But um, I'm mostly talking about when I say young dogs, I'm talking about like eight months and down to their, their training starting, which is about eight weeks old. And um, so what happens is you'll put uh, a dog up on a table, right? And you'll start trying to teach them to cross something. 
and you'll walk them up to a, a beam and you know it doesn't take long to kind of encourage them to come over to the side of the table and they see that there's a beam and it goes over to another table and they kind of look at it and some of them will just go right across it right off the bat right but some of them will hesitate and when they hesitate I've seen a couple of different things that are not as good at building confidence in the young dogs. So when a dog hesitates, if we pull the dog across, right? So we create tension in the lead and we basically force the dog to walk across on the lead that tends to not build confidence as well or as fast as some of the other things you can do. So what I do is first I try to coax the dog out onto the beam and I want to make sure that the beam is wide enough for that dog's size, that it reduces the ability or the likelihood that they're gonna fall off of it, right? Because they already kind of see it. So I start with a slightly wider board. I don't work the young dogs on the more narrow boards, right? I want it to be a little bit wider, at least a two by eight as you're working this. And so I kind of coax them out onto it. And then if they're, if you know, sometimes they'll walk up and they'll look at it and then they'll kind of back away and then they'll walk up and look at it and then they'll kind of back away. After you know four or five attempts to get the dog out onto the the uh, beam, and I'm not rushing these, right? Like I'm like, come on, let's go, let's go, 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 go. They start to come up, and then they're like, mm, no, I don't think so, and they back away. Like that would be one, right? And then I would I would coax them and I try and bring them out. And a lot of times, just doing that and just kind of encouraging them to come to you um, while you're standing next to the beam will get them to come out onto it. If they don't, then what I do with the little dogs is I put my hand under their rib cage and I kind of bounce them across where I'm just touching their feet to it as they go across. And then once they get across to the other table, I, you know, they get all excited when I set them down on the table and then I praise them like they did something really great. Right. And I may do that, you know, five or six times on the first day and then just work other basic obedience, like sit and putts and wait and things like that. And, um, and you do that a couple of times, about three or four, you know, sessions of that and you'll bring them out and they'll start going right across now the other thing to keep in mind and this is that's how i introduce anything that's new that they hesitate with right and then the other thing that we do is um so we we, we get them there and then when they start going across on their own we want to be careful that we give them as much success as possible okay so if a dog is doing well crossing then i'm probably not going to like balance them and watch them, right? Especially once I know, okay, they they pretty much got this. If the dog is, is trying to do it for you and then stepping and falling off, because usually what will happen is they'll miss with one of their back feet. So their rear feet are almost always where they fail when they, when they do this. And they're going across and they're kind of doing good. And then all of a sudden they go to put their back foot and they're off to the side and it goes into air, right? And then they're like, whoa. And once their backing kind of falls off, then the rest of the dog falls off. So if that happens and, you know, the first time it happens, you may not catch them, right? And that's okay. But if that happens, then what I do is I pick them up and I put them back on the table. We start again. Now I'm going to first slow the dog down, right? Because in the beginning, if they'll cross, I just want them to cross back and forth, back and forth, right? Once they start losing their footing, I go, okay, you are going too fast. You need to slow down. So I use my lead. And I don't want to be tight and holding the dog back where it's, where it's a, basically a tug of war resistance, but I want them to, I put my hand in front of them and I show them where I want them to come on the beam. And then I go, wait, so they come out to that spot, wait. And I may use my lead. We wait, good, wait. Okay, now come out here. Good, go, wait, good, wait. Come out here, good, go, wait. You know, and I praise them across like that where we slow them down. And, or if I see that they're actually struggling and they'll do this kind of when they get growth spurts, especially the males. They'll get these growth spurts and they're like, well, wait a minute. I was putting my foot here in relation to my body last week. And now when I put my foot here, I fall off, right? So when that happens, part of slowing them down is if you see with their back legs that they're hesitant, you can actually put your hand on their legs. You grab their foot, right? We're not kind of trying to squeeze it and hurt it, but we're grabbing it firmly enough that if they kind of jerk away, they can't really jerk it away. And I go, put it here. And then I, I physically put it where it needs to go. And on beams, you don't have to do this for very long. But when you move them over to something like ladders, it becomes important again, right? Because a ladder has more air than places to put your foot. So there's more places to miss than there are places to have something to stand on. So especially on their back legs, when they start stepping, all I want the dog to do when it's young is just slow down and let me help it. 
And so I can pick up a back foot and put it on the next rung, or I can put it on the side of the ladder, depending on how big the puppy is at the time and how big your gap is between rungs. And then a lot of times, quickly, they'll start moving their own front feet, and then they'll let you move their back feet, right? And so as soon as they'll start moving their front feet for me, I start leaving their front feet alone because they see where they're putting their front feet. And um, and then I just move their back feet for them. And then once they're, um, they start trying, right? So you'll see, so, so after I move their front, their back feet, what I do is I start going, okay, it's time to move this foot and I'll kind of tap that leg, right? I just kind of bump it with my fingers. If you can see this here, there we go. Both cameras got, I kind of just bump their leg. Like if this is their leg, I go, let's go this one, this one right here, let's go move this one. And I just kind of tap it and that will kind of cue into them eventually. I need to move this leg and they'll, they'll pick it up. But then they'll kind of paw at the air going, but where do I put it? Right. And then I, when it, I let them try it once or twice. And then before I watch them, make sure if they start trying to put weight on it, then they'll, they'll fall. Right. So I may spot a little bit under their, their abdomen, but then if I see them trying it, then I'll kind of grab the paw and then I put it where it needs to go. And I go good ladder or good cross, whatever they're doing. And then I say, okay, now this other back leg, right? Because at that point they're starting to walk out with their front legs. Don't let them get, so you want their legs to be vertical or maybe out to 45 degrees, but not beyond that. Once a dog gets its back legs at like 60 degrees and beyond, they cannot hold their weight of their body on one of those legs. So in order to pick up one of those legs and move it forward, the other leg is going to fail and they're going to fall. Now, if they fall on a beam, they just kind of roll off the beam and fall two or three feet onto the ground. If they fall on a ladder, they typically center on the rungs, which is also not comfortable, right? Now this happens sometimes when a dog is working, mostly because they're trying to go too fast. But if you're moving a dog across and you see them stop their back leg movement and you just keep moving their front legs across, you're setting them up for failure. And so this is why I'm talking about developing the confidence. I don't want to set the dog up for failure. I want to set them up for success. And then I want to give them a chance to do it on their own and they might fail. And then I help them figure it out. And then the placing of the feet, especially the back feet is part of helping them figure it out, right? When you, when we move a dog on what we call toadstools, which are posts in the ground with little round, um, little round platforms, right? They're, they were plywood and we cut these circles and we screwed them on there. And so when we're doing that, especially when the dogs are smaller, it's hard to figure out how do I move from this one to that one? And what has to happen, especially when they have two feet on one and two feet on another one. So they're standing with their front feet on one toadstool and their back feet on another toadstool. And you're like, okay, time to come to this third toadstool. And they reach out with their front paw but their back paws are still on the last toadstool, right? And what they have to do is they have to step forward with at least one of their back legs, put that on the toadstool that their front feet are on, and then they can kind of pick up the other back foot and step forward at the same time onto the next one. And once they figure that out, they, they can do them fairly well. But if you don't show them how to do it, then they fall. And when they fall, they typically, one of these toadstools hits them in the, in the bottom of their ribs or their abdomen. And it's very uncomfortable. And then you say, okay, let's do it again. And now they're like, but that hurts. Now, sometimes it happens and we make the dogs work through it even when that happens. But if I can keep it from happening or I can make it happen as few times as possible, that will build the dog's confidence a lot faster. And I just mentioned the three things, the, the beams, the ladders and the toadstools, but we use that process for everything. So if you see your dog fail somewhere, help them, show them how to not fail before you just keep taking them through and having them fail over and over again, right? Because what happens is that builds the stress too fast and the dog starts just trying to avoid every time you go over, they're like, oh crap, this is the place where I fall. I don't want to do it, right? If you show them how, they're like, well, every time I come here, I'm successful. So I'll try it again, right? And then we just give a little less help and a little less help and a little less help. So hopefully that uh, helps you guys understand how we build the confidence in the younger dogs. Okay, so um, the summer heat stuff. 
I get distracted by little things. I look at them and I go, oh, somebody asked a question. And I start to think about answering it. And I'm like, no, wait till the end. I'll answer it at the end. Okay. Summer heat danger for dogs. Um, I've had several people like, please, please, please remind people about summer heat for dogs. Okay. So here's a couple of things. Um, dogs in cars. Okay. A lot of people are like, don't leave your dogs in cars. I live in Florida and I move with dogs a lot. And so I have to leave my dog in the car a lot or dogs, plural, in the car a lot. Right now, maybe I'm just getting gas and I'm going in and I'm paying or getting a drink and coming back out. It may be on my way home. I have to run by Walmart. Right. So here's what I do and here's what I recommend. First of all, if your vehicle is unreliable, then you need to get a reliable vehicle or don't keep your dog in the car that's unreliable. Like it's not going to sit there and idle reliably. Right. If your car shuts off, you know, periodically, that's bad. Now, you might be thinking, oh, he's talking about old beaters, and that would apply to old beaters, but it also applies to a lot of these newer cars where you have your key fob, and if you leave with your key fob, the car often goes, oh, they forgot to turn me off, and it shuts off. That is extremely dangerous for the dogs. Now, I know that some of these vehicles, I don't know that all of them, some of these vehicles, you can turn that feature off. And if you're going to, if you have a vehicle that's a key fob driven vehicle where you just have it in your purse or on your, you know, in your pocket or whatever, and you push a button to start your vehicle, then you need to make sure that when you walk away with that in your pocket or purse, that it's sensing that that going away doesn't make it shut the vehicle off. You need to turn that feature off if you're going to have your dogs in the car. All right. So I do a couple of things. Number one, my vehicle is labeled working canines do not approach right not like a police don't say you're police dogs or anything like that but working dogs like if you break my windows you're going to get eaten right so i have my cars labeled so that people know don't mess with this car also people know oh this person understands dogs and so the fact that this big diesel truck is out there just idling in the parking lot it's taking care of the dogs right? If your AC unit is unreliable or starting to go out, right? You need to go get that fixed if you're going to keep your dogs in the cars. So you need to make sure your AC is cold or, you know, at least cold enough that it stays safe for the dogs. And you need to make sure that it's a reliable vehicle. And then I use my key fob. So I have a normal key vehicle, right? It's a 2005 Ford Excursion. I love it. And, um, but it has the little fob for locking and unlocking. So I leave my key in the ignition while it's idling and I take the key fob with me so I can get out. I lock my doors so somebody's not going to open a door and get bit by a dog. And then I go and I do my stuff and I come back. Now, one thing I am getting ready to add, and I'm just trying to find one that is reliable and that will work with what I have, is you can get heat sensing, um, heat sensors that go in the vehicle and then they send you an alert if the vehicle gets above a certain temperature, right? And uh, they developed these for uh, canine officers because sometimes their vehicles would, would break down and, and the dogs would be in them and they'd be idling somewhere with the dog in it. The vehicle would break down in the sun. It would get too hot. The dog would die. And the officer never knew that that happened, right? So that's, that's why make sure your vehicle is reliable and make sure your AC is working good in the vehicle, right? So Try not to be in places so long that if something did happen with your vehicle, you don't have that ability. Okay. So enough on vehicles, but I am not a, don't ever leave your dog in a vehicle. I am a, don't leave your dog in a vehicle unless it's running with the air conditioning on, right? Or in the winter time, unless it's running with the heat on. And some vehicles, when you idle them, the heat stops working, or at least it, it stops working nearly as well. Ask me how I know I lived in Alaska for seven years. So keep that in mind too. Right. That, and it's OK if it gets a little colder in there, as long as it's not dangerously cold. And the same thing with the AC. It's OK if it gets a little warmer while it's idling, as long as it's not dangerously warm. And it might be worth your effort putting a heat sensor in there and actually confirming how hot does it get when my vehicle just sits here and idles in direct sunlight in a parking lot. Right. So you can know that. The other thing is walking your dogs on any kind of uh, solid surface. And I, I say that because. That would include concrete, it would include asphalt, but it also would include like hard packed dirt, right? Or sand on a beach, okay? If you can't walk on it in your bare feet, 
you probably don't want your dogs walking on it in their bare feet. Now, there's some exceptions to this. If your dogs have good calluses, if you go out and you do things with your dog a lot outside, they get a lot of activity outside and they have good calluses on their pads, then you can move for a, sh a longer period of time than you probably can in your bare feet, but still you can't just stay on it. So what I do is I try to park in a spot that at least has shade near me, if not directly over my vehicle. And then I take my dog out and I take them out and we move fairly quickly, right? It's not like if I have kids to get out and stuff, I'll do that. But as soon as I reasonably can, I move the dog to the shady spot of the pavement. And then we go to the next shady spot in the pavement. And if you don't have a shady spot, a lot of times there's grass islands, right? And so we'll go from the shade and we'll walk over to that grass island. And then I kind of stop there for a second and let their pads cool off. And then we go to that shady spot and then we go to that island and then we go into the store. Does that make sense? So what I don't do is I don't walk them out on the black asphalt. <clears throat> Excuse me there. Uh, my voice cracked. That was awesome. I don't walk them out onto the black asphalt and walk down the middle of the um, rows of cars in the direct sunlight space all the way to the, the front of the, via the store if all of that is in direct sunlight. Right. So keep that in mind. You can burn your dog's pads. So a couple things you can do about that. They can wear um, you can either move them the way that I typically move them. <clears throat> and if I can't move them that way, I don't take a dog out of the vehicle and go through that space or I find a closer space or something like that. Uh, but you can put boots on them. Now, if you're going to put boots on them, you need to get them used to the boots. Right. And the time to get them used to the boots is not when you want to take them out of the car and go into a store because you're going to have a very interesting situation doing that. So um, when you're at home, you put the boots on them, when you can watch them and keep an eye on them and make sure they're not going to bite and chew on them and ruin them and get them used to them. And then you can walk them around and go on walks in the neighborhood. And then once they're used to having the boots put on and walking around in the boots, then you can just keep those in your car so that when you need them, they're there, you put them on your dog and you take them inside. Okay. So for heat, it's surfaces that the dogs are on and the environment and typically you don't want the environment in a car to be much over 80 degrees. So if you can't keep it below 80 degrees, that can be dangerous for your dogs. Taking a sip of my coffee. All right. So that is our dog topics. Now I want to talk a little bit about a format shift in the um, podcast. So if you're listening to this on live stream, we're still going to be trying to do the, uh, the Thursday night, um, keeping that schedule of the live streams and all of that. But I think what I want to do, the reason I started this podcast is I have a passion for helping people protect themselves, right? To be safe. And I have a passion for dogs because that's what I do. But protection and keeping yourself safe is about way more than dogs. Now, we're still going to have a pretty heavy dog influence. And I would say at least once a month, probably twice a month, um, it will be dog centric or like the planning and stuff that we've gone over in the past, um, you know, that are specific to things that you would incorporate your dog into. Right. We're going to keep at least two a month. Well, I'd say at least one, most probably two of those a month going that way. But I want to start broadening out our topics to include more things that are important for protecting yourself. And um, and they're going to be things like I'm not a financial advisor. Um, but being aware of protecting yourself financially, right? Being aware of protecting your food supply for you and your dogs, uh, being aware of protecting um, your, your property or your larger space, being aware of protecting um, your job and your income and uh, having multiple streams of income if possible, that sort of thing, right? And I was thinking, as I was thinking about this, it, it dawned on me, the people that I learned to train dogs from are, in my opinion, uh, and still to this day, probably some of the best dog trainers in the world, probably the best dog trainers in the world. However, they were never taught to run a business. <clears throat> and this applies, uh, I was listening to a guy talk about um, running a farm as a business. And he basically mentioned the same thing. He said, if you're not comfortable running a business, then you probably don't want to run a farm. Because a farm is a business, you're just, it's a business of farming, right? So you need to like farming, you need to like that stuff, but you have to run it like 
a business. You can't run it like um, you're just, you know, growing a garden, right? Same thing for me. I'm training dogs and selling protection dogs, but it's a business. If the, if the business doesn't make money, the dogs go away, right? It doesn't work without the business operating as a business. So um, creating multiple streams of income, we will start talking about some of the business aspects. And I'm not a brilliant genius or anything. I just want to help people develop these abilities on a broader scale than, than being trapped into just the dogs. I don't know yet if I'm going to change the name of the podcast. I probably won't for a little while um, just to see, like, is this accepted or are people like, no, nah, we're not interested in that. And we'll just kind of see how that goes with the audience. Do we get more people? Do we not? And um, and then we'll, we'll adjust based on that. So we'll do that for probably three, four months. And then we'll see how that goes and we'll see how we want to adjust from there. I'm very interested, especially if you've been listening to us for a while. I'm very interested in your feedback and your thoughts, what you like, what you don't like, what you would prefer. And that really helps us make decisions as to how we're going to move forward with these things. So uh, don't ever hesitate uh, to bring that up. All right. So let's run through some of these um, thoughts and comments as you guys have been going through. So John Rice asked, uh, is that a pre-workout? I am assuming, John, that you are talking about the uh, the X Dog Muscle Builder, and um, I don't believe that it's designed to be a pre-workout per se. Um, I don't like to feed my dogs and then have them go do work with a full stomach. Um, that sets your dog up for having a, what they call a twisted gut, and a twisted gut is extremely dangerous. If your dog twists the gut, they will almost definitely die within an, a very short period of time, even if you get them to the vet, like emergency care speed, like within 10, 15 minutes, they're going to die. Um, I've never talked to a vet who said, yes, we saved a dog who had a twisted gut. The way a dog gets a twisted gut is their stomach is attached at the ends by ligaments that connect it up you know, to the spinal column or the rib cage or wherever it connects up there, right? And when it's empty, it's fairly tight and it's safe. If there's a little bit in it, it's still pretty safe. But if it has a lot of food or water in it and it's hanging, it's kind of like a hammock. And, you know, imagine a hammock with a person in it or imagine a, a mini hammock with like a mouse in it, right? If I spin it, the mouse will spin up and around and now it's twisted, if that happens inside your dog, if they are doing something and they roll or they jump and land in a certain way that makes the, their kind of in, internals have that motion of a spin around, they can twist their gut. And if that happens, they will die. So my general recommendation is dogs eat two hours before any hard work. So if they ate one hour ago, then we don't do any hard work for another hour. We give them two hours to get that food process through the stomach and into the gut. And then the, the gut can move around and it's not that big a deal. You just don't want the stomach full. So I don't think they do much with dogs with a uh, what you would call a pre-workout because you generally don't want a dog eating before a workout. Um, so I hope that is helpful to you. I've got to figure out which cursor is actually mine. There we go. Um, Meryl asked if I have any recommendations uh, for heat sensors in the car. I don't yet... Um, I will check out your link. Let's see. Oh, look at that. Um, so she has this link. Um, I will check it out. I have not, I want to get one that's actually designed uh, for police officers um, because those have kind of a proven track record, uh, but they are expensive. They're like $1,200 uh, for those. And if you just have a pet, it's probably not worth it for you. I will have at any given time, five or six dogs in my truck uh, on a general rule. And that's a lot of dogs to take care of. And that's a lot of money. And a lot of these dogs are under contract already with clients. So that's a lot to lose. So, um, so I'm willing to pay the more money. Um, but I also like, you know, just kind of like how much do you spend to maintain your, uh, Ford excursion? I spend about a thousand dollars a month on maintenance on my truck. And I generally do it about every other month, but I take it in about every other month and I just go look it over and fix whatever needs to be fixed. And it generally runs about $1,800 to $2,600 every two months on that truck. So I don't have a truck payment. I have a maintenance payment. Um, but it is worth doing for me uh, because I take my truck all over the country when I travel. 
and I have dogs in my truck that I need to know that truck is going to run. I need to know that AC is working good. And I need to know those dogs are safe so that when I do my things that I need to do, um, the dogs are getting their training, they're getting their attention, they're moving the places they need to go. And the, the vehicle is operating the way it needs to operate. Um, so, but I, I will try and check these out and, uh, and maybe we can do, um, like a side-by-side -side comparison, uh, a little like teaser, uh, they're supposed to come in this week or next week. Um, there are now two companies that make a canine helmet. Um, the, the company that originated the canine helmet isn't happy about this. And I appreciate that. Uh, I don't know how all of the patents, all that kind of stuff work, but there's another company that's making them. So I ordered one of each. I've used the canine helm for a while and I do really like it. He's got some updates to it. So I ordered a new one. And then there's this other company, I think it's called dark systems. Excuse me. And the dark systems, um, the, the images of it don't look quite as high quality but I don't know. And so I like to give things fair, fair shakes. And I don't like to stick to something just because I met a guy at a conference one time and he was nice. Right. So I have both of these coming in. Um, and we're going to be doing a like side by side comparison. I don't know exactly how we'll run that. I may do the live stream, um, via my, um, Oh, look, my wife just said the canine helmet is here. So one of them has come in. Um, the, my iPad can run StreamYard. I may take it out on the field and actually um, put these on a couple of the dogs and move it around and work the dogs out there and then kind of do a side-by-side -side comparison on them. So that will probably be one of our episodes on that specifically um, because I do um, have, I I'm very much in favor of protecting your dog, their eyes, their head, and their ears um, if you're doing certain things with them. And these products are excellent for that. So... Um, there we go. So, okay. Um, I only have, I know, right? So what we should do, uh, Meryl is we should talk at class because Meryl comes to class with us and, um, ask if other people have any experience with them and see what recommendations we get from them. Cause I would be interested in that, um, for like a secondary one in my wife's car, uh, for when she moves around with the dogs. Okay. So now we're going to run through the Instagram and we have a lot more activity on Instagram than we do on the others because I've been doing it there longer. Um, so back uh, leg muscle development, which would be uh, better going up or down the ladder. Okay, so going up the ladder, they use their rear legs more. Going down the ladder, they use the front legs more. So because that's where the weight is bearing. Whichever set of legs is down, and, and it, this applies to a ladder or any other slope that you're working on. Right, because what we do with our ladders is we work the ladders flat, and then we we put the ladders up at an angle, and we we go up and we come down, and um and we we do a lot of stuff with ladders. Uh, Tracy knows you know, she's been here training with us with the ladder. So uh, when they're going up the ladder, and if you make it really steep, and then have a, a nice platform at the top, so they don't have to come down the super steep, um, they'll use mostly their back legs lifting, right? And then you can slowly make it more and more till you can make make it almost vertical. Um, cause our dogs will climb like a standard a frame ladder. The, the thing is I don't want the dogs coming down an a frame ladder when they're eight to 10 or 12 feet in the air. Um, because that's a bad fall if they fall. So I want them to go up an a frame ladder and then onto a platform and then down. I typically will do up to about 45 degrees down, um, because their front legs, it, it does strengthen the shoulders and everything, which is good for when they land and things like that. Um, but I, they, they're not really designed to do that a lot. Right. So I want to strengthen them without overstressing those joints, if that makes sense. Um, but ladder work is very, very good for dogs. Um, any kind of agility really builds muscle strength because they're flexing. They're getting an isometric exercise, trying to hold themselves on and balance as they're getting the, the regular muscle movement. And it, it can be really good for them. Um, my wife said, oh, yeah. OK, so let's see. I'm actually going to go through these first and then we will uh, see if I can share the pictures with you uh, guys on um, the, the live stream there. Uh, will you be posting links to the supplement or info anywhere? Um, Tracy, you can go back and listen uh, to this. It'll be live on Instagram, YouTube. I don't know if Facebook maintains them, but I think they do. Um, I know float, they go away like an hour after they're, they're there. So if you're not live on float, you don't really see it, but um they're, they will be around and you can just uh, fast forward to those spots and find it. Um, 
Do you provide a small crate when picking up puppies from your facility? Uh, and you're going to be picking up a puppy from my facility, Chris. So I know um, that applies directly to you. Yes. Yeah, so what we provide with our puppies is we provide the, their first crate, which they're going to outgrow, um, but their first crate, their first flat collar, their first lead. And it's one of our leads, a little lighter weight lead um, for a puppy. And we have a chew toy in there for them. And then if you need it, we, we typically let you know what food you need in advance. But if you're traveling and you need a little bit of food, uh, we'll provide a little bit of food for the puppy to make it back home. So that's what we provide uh, when you're doing your uh, when you're picking up your puppies. Uh, website says puppies come with a crate of some sort. Uh, yep, there you go. And they will. They grow, grow up fast. So most of our dogs end up um, at full size using an intermediate crate. That's what I call it. Um, different companies call them different sizes, but it's a 32 inch long crate. Um, and while we're talking about crates, I don't typically recommend the wire crates. The, they're typically like a black wire. Um, a crate should be like a den for a dog. Think of the crate is us replicating a den. So they they get in there and it's all kind of snuggly and, and it's dark. And so it, they can calm down and the outside influences aren't like, whoa, all over. And it's a place that they can go and rest and relax. So I prefer for that and, and multiple other reasons, the... Uh, kind of the plastic very kennel uh, form of crate. There's different companies that make them. Um, but the 32 inch is what most of your dogs will grow into if you get our dogs. Sometimes we have small lines uh, or a small, a couple small dogs in a litter and they can live in a, in a medium. But once they're crate trained, um, they can do fine in the intermediate. So if you do a good job crate training with the little crate you get from us, then you can just go straight to the intermediate crate and you're typically fine. Um, all right. Uh, Oh, you made some toadstools, Tracy. That's great. Uh, when do puppy selections start? So our puppy selections start at four weeks old. So when the litter is four weeks, we start going through the, the selection process. The way that our selection process works is um, there is an order for who gets to choose in what order that's listed on our website, which is fortresscanine.com slash puppies. And um, so if you are ordering a trained dog, you are ahead. If you are ordering... Um, if you're paying in full, you are ahead, right? There's a couple of things that kind of put you in head in line. And so we go through all of our people that have a reservation on that litter and we go, this person gets first choice, second choice, third choice, and all the way, all the way down. And then we go at four weeks, we do a series of pictures with their uh, collars easily visible. And we go, send your first three choices. You know, this is my first choice, my second choice, my third choice. And then we get everybody as close to their first choice as possible. I don't know that we've ever had to go to third choice um, historically, we, we typically will get people either the first or second choice. And, um, but we put three just to, to be sure. If you want to come see the dogs in person, you can do that at four weeks. If you do it at four weeks and three days, understand it may push you back in your selection order because depending on what's going on, I don't want to hold other people up. And we try to within three days of the, it's time to pick your puppies, uh, announcement. We try to, to, within three days, have everybody's listed out so that they're not just sitting there and waiting. So I hope that answers your question. If you still have any other questions, uh, feel free to text me, Chris. Um, that's what I do since uh, Magnum Lock. Yes. If you don't have a key fob, if you put a dog in a vehicle and you don't have a key fob, and you walk away, there is a decent chance that at some point your dog will put their paws up on the armrest and they will lock you out. You also, by the way, want to lock your windows, your automatic windows, because there's also a decent chance that they will put their paws up on the armrest and they will roll the window down and they will go, hey, it looks so interesting out there and they will get out of your vehicle. So keep those two things in mind. Um, you got to be responsible if you're going to have your dogs in your cars. Um, do you ever use booties on any of your service dogs? I typically do not because um, I've figured out easier ways to work the dogs through things. Um, we've worked our dogs at minus 60 degrees in snow and we've worked our dogs at 110 degrees on sand and, um, and concrete and stuff like that. If your dog is acclimated well to the environment, booties are not usually needed, but I have them and I can start using them if I need to, but I typically don't take the time for it because it's, there's only a very small, um, set of situations and scenarios where they're, they're really necessary. They might be nice other times, but the dog's feet are designed to be without, you know, any kind of covering. 
and they do good in all kinds of environments to include deserts and things like that. So there are times that we want to be careful. <clears throat> Most of our problems though are acclimation problems. They're not the dogs incapable of dealing with it. They're the dog is normally in a nice comfy environment and now I'm putting them in a, an extreme environment in comparison and they're not ready for that. Right. So that's usually what the problem is. Um, yep. Robert was answering the question there. The canine helmet is there. That's exciting. So when we get the other one, uh, maybe next week we'll be able to do that one. We will see. Um, anyway, I'll let you guys know. Uh, canine helm supposedly only sells to the military and working dogs. No, they sell to anybody. You just have to contact them. Um, the way I get them is I, their website. You can't really order them through their website, although they just announced they're selling through Ray Allen. So Ray Allen is apparently carrying them. I haven't checked to see if it's live on their site, uh, but apparently Ray Allen is going to be their distributor. Um, so if you're not familiar, Ray Allen is a big time. They're like one of the top three um, dog equipment pro uh, providers uh, in the country. And so RayAllen.com, I think is what it is, but they, they sell dog equipment, all kinds of training equipment. And um, so they're going to carry them. Uh, I just... Um, DM, if you go to, to K9 Helm on Instagram, you can DM him and I just go, hey, I need to get another helmet. And he, you know, we go back and forth and he sends me an invoice and then I pay him. So that's how I've done it. But uh, he is not military law enforcement only. He is making them for the military um, because that's where the money is going to come from, is getting a military contract and providing the helmets for all the military working dogs. Um, so that it makes sense that that's who you're marketing to, but he's not he's not restricting sales only to military and law enforcement. Um, so do the live stream, please. I don't know what that means other than like, I am going to try and do it via my iPad in various different places. Uh, so Von Wolfen's canine, um, if you guys have a uh, specific thing that you want me to do, let me know. Uh, I would be happy to, um, no company makes a 54 inch plastic crate. I don't know. I don't ever need them that big. Is that what uh, um, Magnum is needing? He's going to be a big boy. I know. I uh, can't wait to pick up my puppy. Thanks for answering the questions. Never thought uh, of the window lock. Thank you. And uh, when, when, are, when are you going to Sizzler? I've got a little conversation. Okay. So ah, on the helmets. Yes, I will definitely do that on the helmets. Um, I just got to figure out how I'm going to do it where it'll make sense. Um, and it won't be just kind of confusing and a lot of downtime on a live stream. So I have to kind of get everything set up in advance and probably get the dogs familiar with um, the new one if it's different. Most of my dogs have worn the canine helmet um, a couple times. So I'll probably get, you know, two or three dogs that are more experienced and have worn the helmet more and, uh, and get them out. And then we'll kind of work them on some of the obstacles too and see how their field of vision is. Um, if you're not familiar with canine helm, they're also currently in development. And I think they finally finished up the, the R&D portion. And they're just getting the manufacturing um, side of it set up where they have the current canine helmet version with the single to two single eye lenses is called the Trident helmet. They're they're developing what they call the M2, um, which I, I, I've not seen it in person. So it looks like there's some cool things about it. Um, but one of the things they're doing is it's a it's a single lens um, and the dark systems is a single lens also. So I do know that on the standard canine helmet, there is some um, field of vision restriction with this, the two individual lenses. Now, my dogs have all gotten used to those pretty quick. They just have to look around a little bit more and you look up and down a little bit more and um, and they do fine with them. Uh, but I do like the Rec Specs type of um, lens. And um, so I do know that the Dark Systems one is already built like that. And when the M2 comes out, I will be getting one of those and, uh, and I'll probably do a follow up uh, to those with that and a side by side. The thing I like about dark systems and I really like the guy at canine helmet. So I, I kind of feel bad that there are certain things I like that he's not doing is they seem to be developing much faster accessories to go with the helmet. So they have strobe lights that attach to the top of the helmet. They've got a specific camera. Now I still can run and will run my Mohawk cameras on, on it. Um, and it's set up to be able to do that, but they have uh, camera options. They have um, a muzzle that can attach to it. Now the M2 is gonna have a muzzle that attaches to it as well, um, but this one already has that. There's, um, they both have, oh, they have hearing, hear, let me see if I can say this correctly. They have hearing protection that clips over their ears because there's holes cut out for the ears. And then there's a hearing protection that you can clip in place. The Dark Systems has um, an active hearing protection, which means it's like the, um, 
the ones that you can wear at the range that have a speaker on them and they pick up the sound so that you can talk normal and hear everybody. But then when there's a gunshot or a blast, it cuts that off and then picks back up as soon as it's over. Right. So um, they have that in the dog hearing protection and there's a 3.5 or whatever it is millimeter plug for a receive only radio communication. So if I put a if I have the hearing protection on the dog, now they can sense their environment and I can plug in and have a radio, say, clip to their vest and um, and then I can radio commune with them and they can hear it in their hearing protection, but it's not blasting out to everybody to hear it. Right. So um, to me, those those accessories from a tactical perspective, if I was a police officer, military working dog um, are really fascinating to me. And so I like playing around with them. And then when we do gunshot work with the dogs and stuff like that, um, I only think it's fair that they have hearing protection if we're going to wear hearing protection. So that's um, why we do those things. All right. So I really appreciate you guys all being on. Um, we went an hour and five minutes tonight. This was great. I love the feedback and the interaction. Remember, we're here Thursdays uh, at 5 p.m. Um, we will definitely be here next Thursday. Uh, the question is the 7th of April, I'm going to be in Arizona. Um, so hopefully I can get that uh, set up and still do a live stream with you guys there. It might be abbreviated. And then I should be here the next two Thursdays. But then the last Thursday of April, I'm also going to be traveling uh, through the first Thursday of May. So we'll have to see on those. Uh, but if we can't, um, do them while I'm traveling. We'll definitely pick them up as soon as I get back. So I appreciate you guys being here. And remember, till next time, train hard and stay safe.